Hi, and welcome to Dutch the Podcast. Look, I only had half my headset on there. I'm so ready to party, Tom. That's great. Hey, good to see you, Mike. Nice to see you, too. Uh, and thank you very much for joining us uh, for Dutch the Podcast. Uh, if you are watching this and you've watched a couple and you're thinking, wow, there's going to be more of this great stuff, I encourage you to subscribe to the show, no matter where you're getting it, on any platform, on YouTube. You can even hit the notification button. And when we do a new one of these, we'll make sure that you get it. Uh, how's things going, Tom? Things are going well. Um, we're, um, you know, we've just got our new magazine out, uh, Dutch the Magazine. Uh, went out with some really interesting uh, articles about uh, places in the Netherlands, uh, Warmont in the Bulb District. It's uh, it's becoming uh, springtime again. Well, you wouldn't say yeah. it from looking outdoors, but uh, it's becoming springtime. Uh, the, the tulips will be coming up soon, so we visit the tulip region. Uh, we return to Pella, Iowa, um, where they've got some uh, recipes that have been handed down the generations uh, since they came to America. Mm. Uh, so uh, some Good stuff. Some cookies, uh, some uh, some meals. Um, we uh, we talked to a very well known Dutch uh, supermodel called Frederik van der Waal. Uh, oh. She lives in New York, and she um, she's an entrepreneur, a, a producer, TV producer. She's a, a former supermodel, uh, and it was really fascinating to uh, to talk to her for the magazine. Well, I, I didn't get to do that myself, unfortunately, but one of our correspondents did. Um, so I was going to ask you. Uh, I... <laughs> You didn't do the interview, but I was I was just wondering if she had asked about me. I, I guess not. <laughs> that guy that does the podcast. I want to talk to him. Can you put me in touch? That bald guy on the podcast. I need to talk to him. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so so yeah, the magazine. You know, it's so interesting where the magazine all ends up, and and that's uh, the topic of uh, today's podcast. Actually, well, the topic's not where it ends up, but it ended up in a, a university, a, a college in London, Ontario, where one of the professors actually uses our magazine as classroom teaching material. So wow. I'm going to be asking him about that uh, in, Are you in this podcast. you going to quiz him? <laughs> Give him a little quiz? Make him a yeah. little quiz. So apparently, um, what we write about, uh, specifically when we talk about Dutch uh, cities and Dutch uh, places uh, to visit, is how land planning is different in the Netherlands from Canada oh, yeah. and, and is sort of an example for the world. So that's what we'll be quizzing him on. Oh, very cool. Uh, I'll tell you what, we'll uh, we'll get into the interview in just one second. I will remind you, uh, we love it when you reach out. Uh, please do that by going to DutchTheMedia.com. There's a, a form there that you can fill out. There's the, the contact info there. Uh, also at Dutch the Media, you can get into the publication side of things where there are uh, – countless number of amazing publications and books that you can uh, you can purchase through there so uh, take a minute and visit dutchthemedia.com i i uh, yeah they, they uh, you can take out subscriptions there uh, as well or if there's a specific uh, issue that interests you you can either purchase a back copy if we have them available still not all of them are so that's why it's so important to su subscribe to the magazine uh, because we don't always uh, have enough uh, back uh, back issues but a good number there back issues, and every single issue of Dutch the Magazine can be downloaded in PDF format uh, on Dutch the Media as well. Okay. Well, listen, uh, why don't we get collegiate for a minute? You have a chat with Will, and uh, I'll see you on the other side. Perfect. So we're uh, welcoming uh, Professor William Pohl from Fanshawe College to uh, this uh, episode of Dutch the Podcast. We're very glad to be speaking to Professor Pohl, uh, and uh, you'll find out why that is very soon i hope uh, welcome to the show uh william thank you very much tom it's uh, a real pleasure for me to be here and to uh, appear on your podcast i appreciate the invitation that's great and and you know i appreciate the work we've done together uh, over the past couple of years uh, full disclosure i've given some guest lectures uh, in uh, William's class, uh, which is an uh, environmental design and planning class. Well, uh, let's let let him explain it. So, uh, sure. Will, William, if you could just introduce us to Fanshawe College and then in specific to your role, what do you teach? What kind of class do you teach? And then uh, why are we talking on this podcast? How, how does that fit together? What's Dutch the podcast have to do with any? Absolutely. So, uh, Fenshaw College is uh, here in London, Ontario. We have about 20,000 full-time students. And my role at the college is to teach 
uh, city planning, urban planning. The course that uh, Tom speaks to is my national and international planning course where I'm doing a comparison between national planning here in Canada and national planning in the Netherlands and, and trying to see the similarities and differences. And uh, the Dutch magazine has been a, a big part of giving the students a really good overview and an accessible uh, format to look for planning questions and um, sites and issues that are happening in the Netherlands. So that's really been my connection. Uh, we're looking at, at specific land use planning or sites in Canada. And the articles aren't, are, are, aren't directly related to planning, but once we know the site, then we can look at the site in more detail and see how it relates to planning in the Canadian context. I was really impressed with how, how that uh, works out in the class because you're right. We, we're not a planning magazine. We're not a um, design magazine. We cover Dutch culture in, in you know, in, in its widest sense from history to food to, um, uh, but also uh, lots of places. So you highlight a number of places in, in your class and then um, you bring that back to, uh, to the topic you teach. So I, I was very excited. I, we spoke, um, I, I did my uh, lecture, uh, my guest lecture last night, and, and it was just, just a lot of fun to talk about places in, in the Netherlands. Uh, absolutely, and, and the students really appreciate uh, you joining us um, because you bring a very lived experience to what, what I'm talking about in the Netherlands, uh, talking about in the classroom. They can hear firsthand how it was, how it is to live in the Netherlands. Absolutely. Now, why did, why did you choose uh, the Netherlands? How does it contrast with uh, Canada? Is is there anything that Canada can learn from uh, from Holland in that respect, or is it just comparing the two um, two different approaches? And if so, how does that difference uh, manifest itself? So. Uh, Myself, my heritage is Dutch, so I have a, an interest in Dutch planning. Uh, the exposure that I've had over my years in the planning profession has introduced me to some great planning ideas in the Netherlands. And what I found in my teaching is, in the Canadian context, we have lots of land. In the Netherlands context, we have relatively little land. So we can compare how the two planning ideas strategies are happening in Canada and happen in the Netherlands. So there's difference in approaches. The, the second reason is, is the water piece. Uh, so everyone under, understands that much of the Netherlands is subject to flooding. They have extensive ways of managing water, the flood risks. And in Canada, we have a, a very much uh, different approach. We have lots of fresh water. We're not as concerned. And you can see how water management is different. And then the third piece, which is probably the most interesting, is just the philosophy about land use planning. In the Canadian context, we prepare regulations. Uh, we have policies that, that really prevent bad things from happening. And in the Netherlands, it's more the opposite. They are proactive planning. They are investing in communities. They're investing in spaces to get the best possible planning they can achieve. So it's, it's a little bit different. One is sort of um, regulatory, one is proactive in investment. That's, that's what I've been teaching our students. Okay, I, and, and yesterday when, uh, when I was in the class, there was one, one of your students had recently been to the Netherlands, uh, and, and I found that she really, um, you know, applied what she'd seen there even before um, we, we had this specific uh, class to, uh, to the questions she asked me, and I, I thought that was really interesting. It is interesting, and I think that's the um, four years of studying here at Fancha in the Bachelor of Environmental Design and Planning course. When when students go out into to visit places to see things, they are I think they're more observant, and they they see the relationship between buildings and and transportation and movement, and then they can bring that back into the classroom just as we had that experience last night where she had some very a thoughtful comments on her Dutch experience. Exactly. 
So, so two of the subjects we talked about, and, and they, you choose different uh, subjects from the magazine um, uh, every year, of course, but we talked about two specific uh, topics in the Netherlands. One is the, uh, the big uh, suburb of Amsterdam Southeast uh, and, and tied around a redevelopment of, of a monumental uh, building, a, a former bank um, headquarters that's now being repurposed. Um, and the other one was the uh, Holocaust Names Memorial, a, a totally different type of structure, different setup. Uh, what made you choose, why did you choose in particular those two, uh, two topics? So uh, on, the f on the first site um, in southeast Amsterdam, the, the site and the history around the site is very similar to some of the planning challenges that we've experienced here in Canada. There's an area, a, a poor area, uh, poorly developed, and planners c are coming in to redesign it to, to create a beautiful, inviting, uh, successful community. That's what happened in, in Amsterdam's uh, southeast, that they had those challenges, they made the changes, and over time, they were not successful. It became a, a blighted area. And there are parallels in Canadian experience where we'd, we've done the same things. We've made mistakes in that land use planners thought they had the, the, uh, the solution. They built it as per the, the ideas of the time. In the case uh, of Amsterdam Southeast, it was separating land uses, separating living, working, and recreation. And the result was not successful. We've done the same thing in Canada. What I like about the experience in Amsterdam Southeast is what they did after the fact. So Amsterdam rethought the, the, the challenges and are now rebuilding in a, in a different way. The same number of units, the same number of people, but in a far more human scale form of development. Yeah, yeah. For, for the listeners who are, who are not aware of the area, um, in, in the 1960s and 1970s, um, a large suburb was was uh, built, an exurb almost, uh, because it's not even connected to Amsterdam itself, with huge um, uh, residential um, uh, tower buildings uh, separated by wide uh, park lands uh, with lots of opportunities for uh, to, to enjoy um, the, uh, the, the space. But as you said, they separated all the functions, you know, living separate from working, separate from uh, shopping, separate from uh, recreation, and it just didn't work. Uh, it turned into a desolate, lonesome landscape uh, with with lots of opportunities for, um, you know, um, a, a, a crime to grow, etc. So they've turned it back into a much more human scale model where the different functions are integrated. That that's a development I presume that's taken place worldwide in in, in planning um, in in philosophy around planning. Uh, th that's correct. So we've we've started to change our thinking about land use planning. That living in high rise buildings away from the the ground level without a connection to the to the grade is not good planning. We need to have vitality activity. You want people to have eyes on the street to make it feel safe, to make, you want to have that community built at the, at the uh, ground level and have people take ownership of that public space. And the earlier models where we built high rises with lots of green space at the ground level, where people would leave their apartment building, hop into their car and, and travel out of the community, that was not the good model that created the, the crime uh, the poverty area, the poverty stricken areas. And we're trying to change that by bringing people back onto the street, giving them ownership of that space so that they're going to look after it, that they're going to feel that it's part of their community. Yeah, so in Southeast Amsterdam is, is a prime example of that. And I really enjoy going to the air. I lived there for four years and, and I really, really enjoy going back there and seeing how it's uh, developed over the over time. Now, and, and what about the um, Holocaust Memorial? The, the Holocaust Memorial is, is another aspect of our, of our program. So we look at land use planning at a big scale, uh, Southeast Amsterdam, but also on a small scale, on a site design scale. And the Holocaust Memorial in Amsterdam is, is an excellent example. This site 
commemorates a horrific event that happened uh, relatively recently. People uh, still know what happened. They have family members. And this Holocaust Memorial was a way to commemorate the hundreds of thousands of uh, Jewish residents of Amsterdam in the Netherlands who were sent to the concentration camps and the death camps in Germany. And each uh, brick in the memorial has the name of a person who was lost from the Jewish community. It's important for our students to understand how their designs can bring emotion to people, how it can commemorate really significant events and how those significant events create a sense of place. And this Holocaust Memorial is located close to the original uh, Jewish ghetto in Amsterdam. And it brings people uh, there to really think about how this kind of genocide did happen and the risks that it can happen even in, in uh, in our modern world, uh, recently in, in places like Rwanda or Darfur. Darfur. Um, it's an important reminder for our students and then how they can capture that really important, significant event and commemorate it in place. So that's why it was, was a, a really good example. That's, yeah, that, that, that's great. So, so you're also focused on how, how do we use a couple of city blocks rather than a whole uh, subdivision uh, in terms of land planning. Um, That's what correct. surprised me actually, when I saw the assignments that you'd set, that you'd included one non-Dutch um, assignment with a strong Dutch flavor. And listeners, regular listeners to podcasts, they say, he's going to talk about Pella, Iowa again. And I am going to talk about Pella, Iowa again, uh, because you chose that as one of your, you, you've got so many topics to choose from because you look at, you know, uh, uh, two years worth of Dutch, the magazines, many articles, but you chose Pella. Why? <laughs> uh, I chose Pella because there were some very interesting planning uh, ideas presented. Uh, the article on Pella talks about the history and how the, how the community was established and that the community felt uh, strong ties to their origins. They have decided to celebrate that and create a unique sense of place called Pella, Iowa. And they do that through landscape design with the tulips and the parks. They've done that with the buildings uh, recreating heritage buildings and Dutch style of buildings. So that's first of all creating a sense of place. But then secondly, they're, they're building on that uniqueness and those characteristics by inviting uh, people from throughout Iowa, throughout North America to come and visit them to celebrate uh, important events. And it's, it, it's in fact become a, a very much a tourist destination with over 250,000 people attending uh, a small community of about 10,000 who are um, hosting this, this large community. So it's, it's gone from sense of place, uh, thinking of your heritage, and now it's become an economic development uh, tool to improve the economy, uh, to build community. I, and I think this is one of the things that we talked about last night that the fact that everyone in the community participates in those events and that supports Pella be, being quote unquote Dutch um, really strengthens that community. Sometimes as city planners or as designers, we don't appreciate how important having community can be to, to a city or a place. And um, recognizing that people working together for a common cause, for a common good, makes a much stronger community. Um, Absolutely, yep. yeah. Yeah, I was, I was talking to, uh, to to one of the residents this morning uh, on, on, on a related topic and it shone through again how important that sense of community is for that, uh, that uh, town, small town in, in central Iowa. Um, <laughs> When we first got in touch, when we start, first started doing this together, you approached me in particular about an event uh, that takes place once a decade in the Netherlands. So 
every four years you have the Olympics, every um, four years you have FIFA, but in Holland there's an event that takes place only once in every 10 years, once a decade. And it's, it's, it's related to planning. And, 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 and I believe you went there on a, on a field trip last year when, uh, when the uh, event took place in Almir. Um, yep. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What, what fascinates you about uh, that? What is it? What fascinates you about it? And, and, and what do you take away from that? So, for, for sure. So one of my lectures to my students is about Floriata. And the Floriata is uh, every 10 years, it happens in a different place in the Netherlands as a showcase, first of all, for horticulture and the Dutch growing industry, but also the Dutch government, the municipal municipalities, communities use Floriata as a place to uh, improve the community, to demonstrate good design, good planning. I was first um, interested in it when I went to visit the Netherlands. Uh, one of my relatives suggested that I drop by and go to Floriata. Fast forward a number of years to teaching here at Fanshawe College. My original goal was to bring students to the Floriata to see the project in Almira. In 2022, the Floriata was greening the cities. And that's very much around sustainability, uh, Veg vegetation, creating a healthy city. This was exactly what we're trying to teach our students through our Bachelor of Environmental Design and Planning program. And Floriata was, a, it was an actual living laboratory where you could see sustainability happening. So I was very excited um, to, to go there. Before the event happened, I spoke to the organizers and I was preparing my students to attend. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, uh, I wasn't able to take my students, mm -hmm. but I did go with a colleague of mine uh, to the Floriata site, brought back a lot of the great ideas. Uh, we were able to meet with the chief landscape architect for the Floriata, um, and we're building relationships with the university, Ayers University in Almeria, that has a campus right on the Floriata, uh, they're, in fact, coming to visit here at Fanshawe College in a few weeks so that we can build uh, student exchanges, uh, exchange of information. Well, that's, that's, that's great. So uh, that'd be something that would be uh, available to, uh, to students at Fanshawe um, in, in, in future um, academic years. Uh, absolutely. If I have a chance, I will certainly, uh, I'd love to take some students to the Netherlands to see a lot of the planning sites that I'm talking about in my class, actually. Perfect. Oh, that that'd be great. Um, well, well, that's all, all all very interesting. It's interesting how you can use the Netherlands as a case study in a planning uh, environmental design and planning course. Um, I'd like to get personal, actually, <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, and this is related to to the fact that you're of Dutch heritage, but you were born in Canada. Um, you were born in London, Ontario, and everything points to a strong Dutch presence in London, Ontario. Can you talk a little bit about what it meant growing up, you know, as a Canadian, but as a Dutch Canadian in, in London, Ontario? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I'm, both of my parents were from the Netherlands, uh, immigrants uh, in the early fifties. And for me, having that Dutch community gave me a, a broader perspective. Um, not only was I involved with regular things at, at um, in school and high school, but my parents. You, you told me last night, just sorry to interrupt you, that you were taught uh, Dutch uh, language in your high school in Canada. That, that's correct. So for extra credit, uh, I actually went to Saturday morning uh, Dutch language school. Uh, I took my children to Dutch language school. And I thought, well, I was there anyway. I should take uh, Dutch language classes too. Uh, so I, I ended up graduating with a high school diploma, a grade 12 diploma in Dutch language. That's amazing. I didn't even know that existed. So, so that was an eye-opener for me. Yeah, and, and I think that reflects the fact that there, there is uh, a very strong Dutch heritage here in the London area, both within the, the city 
um, in the communities, but also in Middlesex County surrounding London. Uh, if you go further uh, to the east, Oxford County, uh, large Dutch communities in Norfolk County that all support uh, the Dutch heritage. Personally, my parents uh, were members of the Dutch Canadian Society of London and District. Uh, that started in 1961. And my parents used to go every Saturday night uh, to the Dutch Canadian Society for uh, dancing, visiting friends. And you could really... Or Did looking, they meet there, actually? Uh, no, my parents actually uh, met in the Netherlands. So they were... Oh, then you met your wife there. I met my, my wife. But at I the, knew at there the, was something. Yeah, no. I, uh, so my wife, sorry. My wife was at the Dutch Canadian Society dance one night, and my mother suggested to me that, oh, Dorothy uh, might like a date sometime. So a few weeks later, I call, uh, called her up and asked her out on a blind date originally. Uh, we did actually go dancing. And um, uh, 35 years later, I'm the happily... Is history. <laughs> the rest is history. Yeah. <laughs> all, all started at the Dutch Canadian Society here in London, Ontario. Well, there you go. Uh, yeah, London, and, and, and this is one of those interesting things about the immigration uh, of, of the Dutch in, in the 1950s to, uh, to Canada in particular. Um, Holland was, was uh, very much uh, divided along religious lines in those days. Not anymore. It's a very secular society now. But... Uh, a lot of the Catholic immigrants went to London, whereas a lot of the uh, Protestant and Reformed immigrants went to different areas. Is that something that you could still see in institutions in London in any way? There are still a number of uh, Christian Reformed churches in in the city of London. Um, there is a, a Christian elementary school and a Christian high school that have their roots in the Christian Reformed uh, faith. Um, so the, you also are... have a Catholic Dutch credit union. I, I know they wouldn't even <laughs> want me to say that right now because they've rebranded as purely Canadian. But one of the largest credit unions in Ontario uh, was founded by Dutch Catholic farmers. Is, isn't that correct? The, the, that's correct. So I'm going to say in, in the uh, mid-1950s, uh, the Dutch Catholic priests, uh, along with some business people, started what's called the, what's now called the Libro Credit Union, originally called uh, St. Willibrod Credit Union. Um, and that was, they started it because the Dutch farmers couldn't access traditional uh, credit, lines of credit to buy farms. So this was a way for the, for the community to join together as a credit union and give access for investments and businesses. And, and certainly it's now called the Libro Credit Union has a lot of Dutch heritage. I remember they've had a beautiful uh, mural in their bank offices showing uh, people traveling from the Netherlands to Canada by plane, by boat, um, very inspiring. So there, there were a lot of Dutch connections uh, as well as the, you know, the first president C CEO had uh, Dutch heritage and, and promoted the values that our Dutch immigrants brought to Canada. That's, that's great, yeah. Um, and and um, Libro is only is one of uh, originally fifteen or sixteen Dutch credit unions in Ontario. There's two left: Libro being one, Duca in uh, in Toronto being the other. Uh, but a lot of the smaller ones have amalgam amalgamated, and their DNA still lives on in other credit unions um, uh, throughout the province. Um, Listen, it, it's been great talking to you, and it's great to hear what kind of lessons um, other countries can learn from the, the Netherlands in terms of planning. And it's also great to hear a little bit about the Dutch uh, history of London. Is there anything else you'd, you'd like to share, anything in particular that you think uh, might be relevant? Um, just to, to, to say that the Dutch community in London and southwest Ontario has been uh, a very strong contributor to the economy, uh, to sports and entertainment. Uh, quite often you see names, last names with Dutch heritage. Oh. And, and I'm very proud to um, have both parents who've come to the Netherlands. And it's been, um, it's been great.
Thank you very okay, much. Okay, well, it's been it's been wonderful uh, working with you with the, with the class, and uh, you know, it's great to know that you use uh, our shared heritage uh, in in your teaching. Uh, that's just fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. And and I look forward, Tom, to having you back uh, to the class some next year. Uh, maybe we should do do one of those field trips together. Absolutely. Thank <laughs> okay. you, Tom. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Tom, thank you. That's a, a really interesting discussion with uh, Will uh, and a, a, a lovely guy. Uh, thank you uh, to Fanshawe College for lending him to us. That's fascinating. Uh, it's a completely different way of laying out society in the Netherlands, not just streets. It, oh, oh, waterways, uh, land use, uh, recreation, uh, everything. Yeah, I, 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 I got to uh, do a guest lecture a couple of times at the college, and, and I really enjoyed it. And there's a lot of buy-in from the students, especially the ones that have already visited the Netherlands. There was a, a girl in the class uh, last night when I did, did a guest lecture there who'd been to Amsterdam very recently, and she connected everything, you know, that we talked about to, to back to her visit. Uh, which you really enjoyed uh, for well, an urban once, planning student, right? I was going to say, if you're an urban planning student and you're in a place and immersed in how it is actually working properly, then there's no way that you can't get on side. Uh, it is uh, very cool. Well, a, an excellent discussion. And uh, like always, Tom, a great guest. There's many of those as you go back in time with the podcast. Uh, don't hesitate to do that if this is the first one that you saw. Uh, and uh, or listen to, and uh, we'll encourage you to listen to more of them. Don't forget Dutch the Magazine out now. Go to DutchTheMedia.com if you'd like to subscribe to that, and uh, we will see you next time right here. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, thank you, Mike, and uh, see you next week. <laughs>